What did Descartes know for certain? That he's a thinking thing, a cogito. But what does it mean to think? Descartes does list a few modes of thinking. He says doubting, affirming, denying, understanding, awareness of ignorance, willingness, imagination, and sensory perception. But this, he says, is all he knows for sure. It's the foundation that all other philosophy and science should be built upon. What we have here in Descartes is the beginning of a philosophy of mind. Philosophers of mind ask questions like, how can we schematize the mind, draw it out? How do we analyze its parts and think clearly about how they relate to one another? The 20th century German philosopher, Martin Heidegger, embarks upon a similar project to Descartes. What, he asks, is the fundamental nature of our experience, of our existence? Heidegger has many agreements with Descartes. If we want to live life well, he says, we need to be clear about its most fundamental component. He is, though, more interested than Descartes about how we live in the world, how we relate to the things around us. Descartes' approach to philosophy can be summarised by his famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, which translates as thinking, therefore being. For Heidegger, Descartes has it the wrong way round, though. He thinks that Descartes has neglected the sum, the being. What is it, he asks, to be something? Now, I don't want to delve too deeply into the complicated foundations of Heidegger's thought, but simply, he says, first, we are beings in the world. To explain this, Heidegger begins in a similar way to Descartes. In a short commentary on Descartes, Heidegger asks the reader, what does Descartes care about? Now, he cares about knowledge, science, mathematics, skepticism, atheism, Catholicism, and other worldly things. He has motivations. He seeks. He's looking for truth. And he has care for these things. He cares about them before he is certain that he's a thinking thing, before he's certain that he's thinking about them, that is. So this care about these things is more foundational to thought, to his mind. Heidegger writes, Dasein's facticity is such that its being in the world has always dispersed itself or even split itself up into definite ways of being in. The multiplicity of these is indicated by the following examples. Having to do with something, producing something, attending to something and looking after it, making use of something, giving something up and letting it go, undertaking, accomplishing, evincing, interrogating, considering, discussing, determining, Care, then, at its most foundational, is like focus. It's like intentionality. We all focus on certain things in the world. And so it's a fundamental existential mode of being. But we can go further. Why do we care? Now, let's think about Descartes' most frequent mode of thinking, doubting. It's meant to be purely res cogitans, that is, not physical something we only think. But what are we doing when we are doubting, when we're caring about doubting? We're taking an object of thought, a belief, a sensory perception, a feeling, and we're questioning it. We're performing some kind of action on a distinct object of thought. Is it true that the cat is sat on the mat, for example? But what are we questioning about it? What does it mean to question something? Why question in the first place? There are a number of routes we could take here. 
We might think about needing reliable information about the world, predictability, to being able to interact efficiently with the world, with our knowledge about it. We might think we do it to follow our drives and to satiate our hungers and thirsts or our need for shelter. In short, we care about the validity of our propositions, the truthfulness of them in the moment, dependent on our goals in time. We care about their authenticity. Heidegger also points towards our experience in time. We care about the validity of having an entity present before us and understanding our relationship to it. Here, the cat is sat on the mat, for example. But we also care about the repeatability, the memorialization, the verifiability of the idea that the cat was sat on the mat. So we can add all of these phenomena that Heidegger looks into, and there are many, many more, to the list of things that we know for certain. To summarize though, we are beings in the world, not beings and the world. Heidegger says, for example, that when Descartes is analysing his famous wax, he's not a passive spectator. He's interacting with it, moving it around, tapping it, placing it into the fire. He's questioning something that is present at hand. Which leads us to another of Heidegger's observations, one that begins to draw out the existentialism in his thought. Now, Descartes is doing a lot of doubting, a lot of questioning, a lot of denying and searching. And I have some experience in this area, because if you spend a lot of time reading people like Descartes, or the ancient skeptics, or the postmoderns, the thinkers who spend a lot of time trying to understand the foundational essence of something like truthfulness, you spontaneously begin to do a lot of doubting yourself. Now, this is great, of course. Criticizing, analyzing, questioning, interpreting, noticing things, but it can also be unhelpful. You don't want to have to constantly be asking, what is that? Or why is that? Or what if that? You can become too hesitant too unsure, too doubtful of everything in yourself. If, Heidegger says, we are meant to be beings in the world, and the hyphens here are meant to signify the oneness of our experience with the world, then there are times when we can, as Descartes does, become separated from the world. The world becomes a question mark, distinct from us, and ultimately unknowable. It can lead to Heidegger's interpretation of anxiety. Heidegger sees that if, as Descartes says, doubt is a fundamental foundation of our being, then anxiety is too. We contain an unavoidable existential angst within us. This is what leads to Heidegger's existentialism, and what, I think Heidegger would argue, makes Descartes a proto-existentialist. He says that Descartes is threatened by the possibility of impossibility, that all and everything is false, that he's mistaken, that there is a demon, that he's asleep or mad, a constant searching for oneself. But we do live with the possibility of arriving at satisfactory conclusions too, however temporary they might be, what Heidegger calls an end situation. We are entities with a capacity for self-perfection. Descartes thought he'd found the certain knowledge that cured his existential doubt. So in conclusion here, I want to add that Heidegger is not necessarily anti-Cartesian. His relationship with Descartes is much more nuanced than that, but I think he does provide the best attempt to overcome the idea of a mind-body duality that we've largely inherited from Descartes. Antonio Damasio, who we looked at last time, writes that this is Descartes' error, the abysmal separation between body and mind, 
between the sizable, dimensioned, mechanically operated, infinitely divisible body stuff on the one hand, and the unsizable, undimensioned, unpush-pullable, non-divisible mind stuff on the other. And why is it important to get this stuff right? Because it guides our thinking in many, many other areas. Whether it's ideas like the mind being similar to a computer application, or how advances in mental health and psychiatry occur. So what can we add to Descartes' philosophy of mind, his list of certainties that we talked about at the beginning? This has been a brief overview of a Heideggerian critique, and one that's nowhere near exhaustive. Being and Time is a very, very long and complicated work. But to Descartes' rationalism, we might add a few concepts like being in the world, care, time, authenticity, present at handedness, and anxiety. Hey everyone, I feel very lucky to be able to say that I'm finally at the point where I can commit full time to making these videos. Um, it's a great honour to be able to do that. I absolutely love doing it. I'm going to make two or three videos a month and continue to improve the quality and the research and do a few more experiments and chats and rambles in between. But it is a time consuming job. It's a full time job and it is just me. So unfortunately, right now, Patreon is still the only way that then and now survives. So if you get any value from these videos whatsoever, then please consider pledging a dollar or two dollars on Patreon. If you pledge five dollars or ten dollars or more even, I will add your name to the credits, I will put scripts and the audio, and at some point the videos out early for Patreons only. So if there's anything you'd like to see there, then please let me know. But if you can't afford that right now, then of course it's enough to just press like, subscribe, share, and remember to click that bell to be notified to new videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.